We're going to talk about stress urinary incontinence and specifically non-mesh alternatives to treatment. Here are my disclosures. So as far as the learning objectives, we're going to re review the evidence on several non-mesh alternatives for stress urinary incontinence treatment, and we're going to discuss the patient counseling involved with each of these. So this is um, one of my blog posts on our um, hospital's website, and this was actually initiated by multiple patients asking, what are my other options? Are there other options other than a, a mid urethral sling? And I said, absolutely. And here we go over all the options for, um, you know, I go with them individually in the, in the clinic room, and I thought, let's make this more publicly available. Let's make a handout for them so that women are aware that there are a lot of options. Uh, we've also recently done some um, research um, on a qualitative analysis um, for women who've experienced mid urethral sling complications. And one of their top concerns or themes from this is that they wanted to have been counseled on the alternative treatment options. They kind of felt like they got shuttled into a sling and didn't know that there were other options. And so, again, maybe that's their perception, but it, it, you know, there are options, and um, I think that speaks to this, the role for this. So our current understanding is that female stress during incontinence has multifactorial etiologies. Childbirth injury is the prom primary risk factor. This is the trauma of the baby's head passing through the birth canal, and it changes the support structures, okay? Additionally, denervation of the pelvic floor contributes. You've got aging and hormonal changes. You've got conditions that increase intra-abdominal pressure, and so that intra-abdominal pressure um, overwhelms the urethral resistance, and then you have um, a higher rate of um, incontinence in people with connective tissue disorders, and so there's a collagen elastin um, relationship there. But one of the things I do is I do um, counsel them on the etiology. There's not one thing that's going to cure your stress incontinence. This is nerves, muscles, support structures, coordination in the brain, um, so that they understand we're c compensating with a treatment, but we're never going to go back to the way they were. Um, this is a, um, one of my, I guess, favorite uh, st slides in that it shows the histologic cross-section of the female urethra in a young person and an old person. So at 15 years old, you have a, a, a urethra that has fully um, circumscribed skeletal muscle um, as well as smooth muscle. As one ages, and then this is a Paris woman, who the vaginal side, so you can look here, this is the bladder neck, this is the external urethral meatus, this is the urethral lumen, and this is the cross section. This is the vaginal side and this is the bladder side. So you lose that um, muscle aspect on the, um, I guess that would be the ventral side of the urethra, whereas in the young person it's um, completely circumscribed. So again, it just shows there's, so, there's one, this one aspect of change. This is what we call our treatment tree at Virginia Mason, and Dr. Kabashi, my partner, and I have sort of developed this collaboratively. We, we do different iterations of it, but what we like about it is that it puts, it's a way to counsel the patient and have some like a tool that's between us that we can talk about it with. So we talk about, you know, maybe your diagnosis is stress incontinence, or maybe it's overactive bladder urge incontinence, or maybe you have both. And here are all the options that we have to treat you, and here are all the options we have for this. So it kind of separates the two, which is nice because they think it's just one big thing. And then it kind of explains that there are risk factors that we can target. There are surgical options, there are non-surgical options, there are clinical trials, there's first line, second line, and third line. And so, you know, it's a nice tool that we use to um, counsel patients, and um, it's been very um, useful. Um, so conservative management, that's certainly an option for people who are minimally bothered. Um, you know, they may want to have a consultation to discuss their stress incontinence, and then ultimately decide they're, you know, they're okay as is. But they're often, they're coming in doing these things. Um, so in my... Um, Prior work, we've done, I've done some focus groups on women with incontinence and OAB, and they're maximizing, they're optimizing, they're self-figuring this out. They're using pads. Um, they're limiting their fluids in strategic ways. They're preventatively voiding, and they're avoiding activities where they know they're gonna, um, it's gonna worsen things. Um, there are like new underwears now that, oops, that have um, built-in absorbency, um, so they're, use, you know, they're trying to use materials to help women. Um, and things like that. And there are, um, th there's data to show that high impact activity is associated with um, incontinence. So we're talking about the CrossFitters, the, the um, military, the parachute, people, who, uh, gymnasts who have this high impact activity. So tobacco cessation. 
Um, we know that coughing raises the intra-abdominal pressure, and um, smokers have that chronic cough. Also, other conditions can lead to chronic cough. And so I had a patient um, recently who had a terrible chronic cough, and um, you know, obviously then terrible incontinence for her. And she was super bothered, and it was just getting worse. And I said, you know what, let's work on your co chronic cough. And so she went through ENT and GI, and ultimately got her cough under control, incontinence basically um, alleviated. And so it was nice to kind of see that that was the, you know, the root factor. Obesity and weight loss. So epidemiological studies have shown that obesity is a strong risk factor for urinary incontinence. There's a stronger association for stress um, predominant mix than urge. And there's a dose response effect. So for each unit increase in BMI, you have a 20 to 70% increase in your risk of urinary incontinence. On the flip side, if you lose weight through um, surgical methods or through behavioral weight loss, um, there's been multiple studies that have shown improvements in the prevalence, frequency, and symptoms of incontinence. One of my, again, favorite studies, I have favorite studies, um, is the PRIDE study. And what, what it is, is because it's a high quality study that has good data that we can use it to counsel our patients. But it showed, um, it recruited overweight and obese women and the, uh, with over 10 episodes of incontinence a week. And they were randomly assigned, assigned to an intensive six month um, uh, fitness and weight loss, nutrition and fit loss, um, behavioral weight loss program, followed by a 12 month maintenance program, or the control group had a structured education program. And they showed that modest weight loss, 5% of their weight loss, 10% of their body weight, was sufficient for significant urinary incontinence um, benefits. And so for patients, you know, they come in and they, they maybe are there on the edge and they know that they've been motivated to lose weight, they want to lose weight, and you can say, look, let's make a small goal of you know, encourage them to work on that and then um, another reason to um, move forward with that and they can improve their urinary incontinence. Pelvic floor physical therapy. This is one of the mainstay, first line treatments for female stress and incontinence. And there's high level of evidence um, and grades of recommendation in multiple studies. It's low risk. It does require a motivated patient. Um, and the Cochrane Review in 2014 showed that women who were in the um, pelvic floor physical therapy group were eight times more likely than controls to report cure and 17 more likely to report cure or improvement. And so the way I counsel my patients on this is, you know, I say, you know, you can go to the gym and you can like work out, but you don't really know if you're doing it right. But if you go with a trainer and they're showing you how to do it and making sure you're doing it right, you're going to have more effective results. Um, and so then I say, you got to go to physical therapy with a physical therapist um, and we can find one that's local to you and, and um, specializes in it. And um, I also say, you know what, let's invest in this for the rest of your life because you can get these tools and you'll get the tools. You'll have your home exercise plan, and then for the rest of your life, you'll have that. And women, by and large, are very um, compliant and interested. So pessaries. Pessaries are generally designed for prolapse, to reduce the prolapse and relieve symptoms, but they can be fit to support the suburethral area. So patient selection is very important. You have to have a symptomatic patient with sort of the desire to try this and do this. Um, some of them will not tolerate it due to pain, poor tissue quality, um, or if they have had multiple prior surgeries, they're not going to have that compliant um, vaginal wall. And my most sort of popular patient to do this is maybe a young woman. They're, they've um, maybe had one baby and they want one or two more, and they're like, oh, let's, uh, we want to hold off until they're fully done with childbearing to maybe to have a definitive surgical plan. And so we say, let's do the pessary so that you can go on your runs um, and then um, delay uh, a surgical treatment. Um, and so they're very happy with this. There's been studies to show sh short, medium, and um, uh, sorry, high satisfaction in sh um, short, medium, and long term, and a, lo a low complication rate. Um, they may uh, complain of a discharge or just an initial, some initial um, bleeding or spotting, but overall they do well. So incontinence pessaries are different from pelvic organ prolapse pessaries. And the reason why is that you want to fit it so that there's some support under the urethra. I kind of explain it to them like, we're we're, at, we're kind of squishing under the area of the, sub, of the suburethra and so that there's something there when you're you know, jumping and, and working out. And so the most, one of the most popular is a ring with support. This is the part that's kind of fit under the bladder neck urethra and then this sort of goes deeper in the vagina. Um, once it's fit properly, it should be comfortable and it should not even feel like it's there. Um, so there's different sizes from small to larger. Um, sometimes they can't tolerate the knob because it's kind of big and so you go with just a ring um, or if they have prolapse too, or they want additional support, a ring would support. And what's nice about these three is that they're, 
easily put in and out. They can self-manage it. Um, the ones with the, without the support are like they squish better, so they're easy to, easier to come, go in and out. Um, and then alternatives, there are other vaginal inserts that um, can give that support. So I've got some women who play tennis and they leak when they play tennis, um, and so they use a super tampon. So a large size tampon, not when they're on their period, but when they're you know, doing sports, so they can kind of just um, provide that subdurethral support, and it's enough to help with mild incontinence with physical activity. There is a, a product on the market called the Poise Bladder Support, and it's kind of the same thing. There's a, um, like this plastic, uh, piece that gets covered by like it's like tissue paper and it you know you place it in like a tampon and it's supposed to kind of be that support that helps the hypermobility okay um, it's readily available in the drugstores there's different sizes and there's a sizing kit um, it's not that expensive and most women are willing to try it um, the feedback from my patients has been it's not that comfortable and so they kind of go with more of the other sort of softer rounder you know not pokey things but it's certainly worth a shot um, medications for stress incontinence um, are potentially an option. Um, the, most, the, the medication with the strongest data is duloxetine, also known as Cymbalta. It's a noradrenaline and serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Um, it's been well studied, and it's indicated for stress incontinence in Europe, but it's not approved for use in the US. It's generally used for depression and sometimes pain. And the reason it was not approved in the US was because of risk of suicide and increased risk. And so it's just hard to kind of um, prescribe and manage someone on that knowing that that risks exist but certainly they do use it in Europe and the evidence is strong and so I sort of mention it to my patients but we generally don't go on that route sometimes they're on it for other reasons like they're on it for depression and then I'm like you know what this is probably a good one for you actually um, vaginal estrogen um, it may improve their um, urinary incontinence um, but the most of the data is in OAB and urge incontinence there is um, limited observational evidence for improvement in stress and urine incontinence in the postmenopausal woman. Um, the mechanism of action is that it thickens the urethral mucosa, it enhances vascularization of the periurethral tissues, and so it's sort of doing good things to the, the tissues around. But systemic estrogen, interestingly, has actually shown negative effects on um, urinary incontinence in that it decreases uh, collagen cross-linking, increases turnover. So I'd like to make that distinction with patients. Vaginal estrogen, um, is local and it's going to act on the local tissues, the urethral vagina, bladder area, the systemic estrogen, totally different, different indication. Um, and so I think, again, women are, it's safe, and um, if they have like vulval vaginal atrophy, dryness, and some mouth incontinence, it's certainly a, a very reasonable option. Amipramine is a tricyclic antidepressant. It causes bladder relaxation and increases some outlet resistance um, very mildly. And so it's off-label use to use as urinary, for, again, for incontinence. But some people are on it for other reasons, or they've been on it. And so you should know that that, um, there, that is um, used out there. Um, there is some data on alpha agonists, but again, not good sort of long-term or efficacy data. Um, but so th there are medications um, not popularly used in the US, but um, it, it is an option. And I'm talking stress incontinence here, not for ov overactive bladder or incontinence, which has a whole host of medications. So urethral bulking agents, um, these have been, you know, many have been on the market and off over the years, but this is a list of all of them, and um, the three that are on the market right now are uh, macroplastique, uh, which is a polymethylsilaxone particle, durasphere, which is a carbon-coated bead, and coaptite, which is a calcium hydroxyl apt apt uh, apatite. And um, efficacy is good, safety is good. Um, durability is sort of very variable. Um, I think there's a lot of technique involved, and so good technique and right patient selection, managing expectations, um, probably leads to better um, results in that way. Um, there is some data to, to um, show that you might need more than one injection, um, one versus two, um, and then re-injection over the years. Um, very lim um, uh, limited or transient urinary retention, so it may be 24 hours of urinary retention, but then it generally resolves. So I think this is a good option for patients, either before, let's say, surgical management, maybe after, um, someone with more um, less mobility and more um, um, already has some support, um, and just someone who's interested. It can be done in the office um, or in the operating room. There is a um, bulkamid has been studied, and it's you know there's literature and the data on it. That's the last one on there. It's a homogenous hydrogel. It just got FDA approval like 
last week or days ago or you know very recently and so that's coming um, on the market as well um, so something to follow something to consider you know ask patients so co2 vaginal laser this is um, increased in popularity it's a fractional co2 laser and there's multiple um, companies it's most commonly used for the treatment of genitourinary syndrome of menopause um, atrophy dryness um, the mode of action, it's a pulse laser photothermal energy that targets collagen structures, capillaries, and epithelial layers. They'll show, um, you know, it increase, increases the sort of thickness and quality of the tissues. This is a picture of, it's like a cylindrical or um, probe that's placed in the vagina and then it's like pulsed and rotated and then withdrawn. Um, it's an office-based <coughs> procedure. It's usually a series of treatments. It's not covered by insurance. It probably never will be. It's out of pocket. Um, it's thousand um, dollars it's um, that again it's out there you, you should know that it exists patients will ask you so I've been thinking about this or I was told I should do this or I've been you know that's what what happens to me is that patients come to me and they get they want my advice on whether they should do this there was an FDA warning in July of 2018 um, so even though this fractional co2 laser has been approved for dermatologic and gynecologic indications Lasers have not been um, to date approved for the use in vulval vaginal atrophy and sexual dysfunction. And so the FDA warning um, was really about deceptive health claims and then some um, potential risks. Um, it hasn't been evaluated or confirmed by the FDA for vaginal rejuvenation. And there was concerns about vaginal burn, scarring, pain during intercourse, um, recurring or chronic pain. Um, all the companies that were in existence at that point, point received letters um, kind of warning about these um, deceptive practices, and they're now monitoring um, reports of adverse events. Um, so here's a summary of the data on vaginal laser, and um, uh, a lot of them are on that ER, LAT, YAG laser, some of it are with the um, CO2, like the Mona Lisa. These were, they were looking at stress incontinence, OAB, and vulval vaginal atrophy. These are the indications. The study types are generally observational. Um, the study groups you know, range from small to, you know, in the, like, the hundreds. Um, variable outcomes, whether they, what are they looking for? But the most striking thing is that the follow-up is pretty short. You know, one month, six month, the longest would be, there's some 12 month and one 36 month. So long-term studies are needed. Um, this should be followed and um, um, considered. The Cook Myocyte Celebrate clinical trial is a adaptive, um, basically double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial of a cell-based therapy using autologous muscle cells. They get a biopsy of the thigh. This company grows up the cells. We re-inject it into the urethra um, to try to um, regenerate um, incontinence uh, cells. Office-based procedures, um, I, uh, we're participating as one of the 19 sites across the country. Data from the prior clinical trials not yet available, so that's forthcoming. This one's in current um, recruitment mode. So again, cell-based therapies, potentially for the future, not currently available. Some patients will get offered this you know, in other countries or you know, kind of clinics that are doing stem cell therapy, not ready for prime time yet, but the data is really soon to come. I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. Copal suspension was recommended in the um, NICE guidelines in the UK. It's effective. It's considered maybe less effective and less invasive or more invasive than a mid urethral sling. Um, so it's decreased in popularity with the introduction of the. Basically, it went down and slings went up. And but it is reasonable to offer in patients who want a non mesh alternative. So it's making a comeback maybe. Autologous fascial slings are also making a comeback. They've always sort of been in our armamentarium and have a, a low steady um, increase. But essentially, it's autologous fascial sling from the rectus or the um, um, fascia lata. It used to be done in people with ISD, low leak point pressures, complex fixed urethras, but now it's considered also being used in primary stress incontinence. Um, complications can be retention, wound issues, voiding dysfunction, urge, but very good long-term durability. This is uh, Jerry Blavis's data on years of follow-up. Our data, again, shows good satisfaction, good success. They're not always dry, but they're happy. So while non-mesh alternatives, um, the mid urethral sling is a gold standard procedure. It's re reproducible, it's effective. The vast majority have a great clinical benefit. For the small amount that don't, we have opportunities to improve their care. Um, and I think we should think about our biases when we treat 
treat, present options, present all the risk benefit alternatives, present all the options, educate women so they better understand their condition and then um, can move forward from there. So there are many options for stress and incontinence and many more in development. Thank you.